to thank each of you that have been praying for my wife, Brenda, and her hip replacement surgery. She's doing very well, uh, getting better every day. Uh, not quite good enough to be here this morning, but uh, she wanted me to make sure I thank you for your prayers, your cards, and I really like to thank you for the food. <laughs> uh, it's been a great blessing for uh, the outreach and the concern from the church family. So thank you one and all for your part in that. Why don't we stand together as we sing and raise our voices to the Lord.
Thank you, worship team. Appreciate every time you do that. And I get to come afterwards, and it's a blessing. One, before we dismiss our kids to Children's Church, I have one announcement I want to remind you of. It's printed in the bulletin. If it's new, it's blue. Okay. Men's breakfast. 
Those of you, uh, uh, those of you guys who would like to have, if you're finding that your cholesterol levels are just a little low, we'll fix that for you. And if your cholesterol is a little high, we'll bring some celery and some carrots. But anyway, guys, uh, you're welcome and invited to come to a men's breakfast coming up on March the 9th, 8 o'clock in the morning. We look forward to, <coughs> excuse me, look forward to seeing you all there. Before we dismiss our children, our children for their time together, let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for these children that you've given to us. In each home, each family, each young boy, each young girl, thank you, Father, for them. And I would pray today, as uh, they go to their time, open their hearts to truth, open their minds and their perspective on what you want them to understand. Please, Lord, be with their leaders as they take them through the lesson today. Help them to have wisdom and sensitivity so that our children might learn about you in a safe way and get to know you and get to know you better. And Lord, would you be with us in our time here as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, children, you may be dismissed. And as they're dismissing, I encourage you to take the sermon notes are in the bulletin. If you want to follow along, you can take that and follow along with us. <coughs> We're in the book of Hebrews right now. Hebrews is a book that was written to young, uh, a young church, a young group of people that were under tremendous persecution. <clears throat> Hebrews was written to people who had grown up in the Jewish faith. And all of that they had read and learned talked about a promised Messiah that was coming. Well, when Jesus showed up, he was a fulfillment of all of those promises. Many of those Jews saw Jesus as their Messiah, and they rejoiced, and it was great. And they said, yes, we've seen the promises of our Bible fulfilled. <clears throat> Yet there was another contingent, another group, some of the religious leaders. And they had a very high view of themselves. And they looked down upon people who weren't as educated and weren't as smart and weren't as sophisticated as they were. And they weren't about to give up their position of power and let some guy who them would look like a renegade, Jesus, to steal the show from them. So they began to uh, look down upon anybody who would claim Christ as their Savior. And so the book of Hebrews was written to those people that had claimed Jesus as their own. Yes, they recognized him as their Messiah as a fulfillment of their scriptures in their Bible. Yet they were being severely persecuted by the very people that they'd grown up with. Our days, we call them Sunday school teachers or pastors or deacons and so forth. <clears throat> it would be like some people that you have respected as religious leaders just come down on you and persecute you and shut you out because you have believed in Jesus to be your Messiah. So they were being persecuted that way. <clears throat> they were also being persecuted by the government. The, Ro Rome, the Roman Empire had gained control of a large area and had given Israel some element of self-government, but they didn't like the way that there was some conflict between the Jews and the Christians and so forth. So they came down and they started persecuting them too. And so some of these, these new believers, they, well, they'd grown up in the Jewish faith, but they these believers are being persecuted horribly. And I kind of wonder, is this really worth going through? So the, 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 the writer of the book of Hebrews is writing this to encourage them. It's also written to those who are of the Jewish faith that were, they hadn't really either had the courage or had the insight. But they were warming up. They were leaning in to Jesus. They hadn't really accepted him as their own. Maybe they didn't understand. Maybe they were afraid of the persecution. Maybe they just, it was too much for them to make that jump. And so there was kind of a fringe group on the edge that were leaning in. And then there were some on the other side that were, had been persecuting, and yeah, they kind of were interested, but they were kind of on the fringe. So there's kind of like three groups of people that the book of Hebrews was addressed to. And so in that tradition of Judaism, in all of Judaism, there are three individuals that stand above all else in honor and esteem. 
You can probably think of people in your life, <clears throat> Christians or spiritual leaders, that would have had a big impact on you that, we, that you could esteem quite highly. Well, for the Jews, Abraham, the father of our faith, Moses, and then there was King David. Abraham is honored for being the father of Judaism. Moses was honored for being the savior of Judaism that helped bring them out of, of Egypt. And David for being king of, of, the Judea, of the Jews. Others are highly exalted, but none stands above these three. But Moses in particular is elevated primarily for how his mighty acts of courage and inner strength really saved Israel from the ongoing tyranny of the Egyptian pharaohs. It all started when the descendants of Abraham, many years before Moses, had found themselves in a famine and they went down to Egypt to buy food and the whole family stayed down there. Things began to work quite well and they, they multiplied and they, they made that their home, forgetting that God had promised them the land of Canaan, which is now Israel, God had promised that to them. They got real comfortable there. Well, they grew, they multiplied, they were prosperous, they did quite well. And the Egyptians were thinking, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? They're, they're going to be mighty, they're going to take over us. So they said, I don't know what, we'll make them our slaves. So they, they, they imposed this horrible slavery on them. They had no way to get out, no way to get away. Until God called Moses. Moses started his ministry when he was 80 years old. I am not going to ask how many in our congregation are 80 years old or above, but you know who you are. Some of you who know that you're close, you also know who you are. <laughs> but starting a ministry at 80 years old, God raised up Moses <coughs> at, at the age of 80, and God did some miraculous things to him, and the, the best was yet to come for Moses in his ministry. In particular, in addition to Moses, it, it, there was a, a, he was the point man for leading Israel 40 years through the wilderness. He was God's spokesman. He was their messenger of the word of God and for the construction of the tabernacle. The works of Moses are recorded in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They're spoken, they're revered in all the rest of scripture. And Moses did more to establish the faith of the Jews than any, any other single individual. He gave them the Ten Commandments. He was the messenger for the details of the law given at Mount Sinai. He gave uh, God's, God's exact prescription for the design and construction of the tabernacle and its furnishings. He gave specific orders and procedures for holiness and activities regarding the priesthood. He commanded their army in the wilderness when they were under attack. He oversaw the distribution of, of their food in the wilderness. He administered rulings among the people. And he also is the writer of the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And you think, oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Genesis. What's the first line of Genesis? Uh, Moses wasn't there in the beginning. <clears throat> but even though he wasn't there through the, the, the reminding work of the Holy Spirit and oral tradition that had been passed down through the years, Moses was faithful to record the very words that were prescribed by God. And at the very end of the book of Deuteronomy, we read an epitaph about the death of Moses, probably written by the one who was his successor, probably Joshua. It was his, his assistant, but it was included in the book of Deuteronomy. <coughs> Folks, we haven't even got to the book of Hebrews yet. This is all introduction. It sets us up for this. <coughs> in Deuteronomy 39, it says, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hand on him so that the people of Israel obeyed him as uh, and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since is, in Israel since like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all the land and for all the mighty power and for the great deeds and terror that Moses did in the sight of Israel. Wow. In summary, Moses seems 
bigger than life in the eyes of those who honored him. <clears throat> but in the book of Hebrews, Moses is compared with someone of even higher rank. The theme of the entire book of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ. Jesus is superior to Abraham. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to David. And in the study today that we're going to look at, we'll focus particularly how Jesus is superior over Moses in his work and his person. Now, it's not to take away from Moses. Moses was high up. He was exalted. But Jesus is infinitely higher. And we'll see from our text today. So let's start. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 3. I want to read the first four verses. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more uh, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. And we'll continue in verses 5 and 6 next week. <clears throat> but here we have uh, the, the spokesman, Moses, who himself someday will bow the knee before Jesus and proclaim him as Lord. He is supreme. Now, we're going to rapidly run through an outline quickly here. The book of Hebrews is divided into three segments. We're looking at the first one right now. Christ is superior to the prophets, to the angels, and to Moses. And that's the part where we're beginning right now. In the superiority over Moses, we're going to cover some of those verses today. Christ is superior in his work. But we're going to look next week at Christ is superior in his person. And then... We're going to talk about another one of those warnings. We talked a little while ago that there are five warnings that seem to us just kind of dropped in, almost out of the flow of thought. It's almost a, by the way, moment that the writer of Hebrews had. But today we're going to take a look at Christ being superior to Moses in the work that he accomplished. And we want to look at that today. <clears throat> First of all, in verse 1. Jesus is superior to Moses in his work because of the holiness in his calling. He says in verse 1, Therefore, holy brothers, and the implication culturally is sisters to men and women, you who share in a heavenly calling. And it really refers to believers, holy brothers or holy brothers and sisters. And it's kind of a generic term for both genders. Uh, it's similar to the term mankind. And we find that same concept in Acts chapter 1, verse 15. In those days, Peter stood out among the crowd and uh, among the brothers, the company being of about 120 persons. Well, ladies are persons too, as much as men are. So here he's referring to the entire crowd. But it's not so much both genders or which gender or whatever, it's the, it's the term he describes them. Holy brothers and sisters. Holy. <clears throat> so he's really talking to those Jews who have said, yes, we read in our Bible about this coming Messiah. <gasps> and it was Jesus. And they began to follow him and they embraced him as their, as their personal savior. And this is who the writer of Hebrews is addressing to them because they've been going through so much uh, persecution. This, the word holy, it's a Greek adjective that describes what God is like. Sacred, pure, and blameless. Now he's calling his people sacred, pure, and blameless. Now if you look at your life, you look at your daily activities, your thoughts, or your past, and I look at my life, and my past, and I'm aware of the things in my life, sacred, pure, and blameless, doesn't seem to be the big banner that flies over my castle. And probably the same for you. But that's a cool part about it. A person can come from an environment or a life or stupid life choices that makes them anything but sacred, pure, and blameless. They come broken, dirty, and cast off. And when they come to faith in Christ, 
The Bible says that he shed his blood to pay for their sins. The, the, the very things in their life that separated them from God, Jesus came to pay for. And so now, as God looks at me, and he looks at you who have embraced Christ as your Savior, he sees you as being sacred, pure, and blameless. It's not as though you've never done some of that dumb junk, but Jesus has cleansed it all, wiped your slate clean, and you can stand in the presence of God, just like that. Sacred, pure, and blameless. <clears throat> in other places in Hebrews, the writer addresses those who are just kind of interested in maybe looking in, or maybe even coming to church, but not really having trusted Christ yet. Maybe haven't really understood what it means to invite Jesus into their heart. Others who read this book could only uh, be seen as opponents, but they're still and uh, they're still adamant. These other people on the outside, you have to be faithful in following the laws of Moses. But the writer of Hebrews is saying, except Jesus and your requirement to follow the law, we know that you can't keep it. Jesus already had on your behalf. But this, dry, this writer here of Hebrews is addressing the true believers in Christ. Some of those were strong and growing in their faith. Some were just new and they were frightened by the persecution of, of their, their own Jews or, or the Roman leaders. But in Christ and under his blood, we are holy. We are set apart. We're set apart from God's wrath. We're set apart from our life choices that have brought the consequences upon us. And in the state of holiness, it says that we share, or depending upon your Bible version in that verse, or maybe there are partakers of a heavenly calling. We share, or we're, heaven, we're, we're partakers. Many of us here, we're different ages. We drive different cars. We have different hobbies. Some don't have a car. Uh, there's different tastes in food. Uh, some like broccoli. Some don't. You won't go there, Doug, we'll leave that one alone. Yet each, what each of us has in common, if we've embraced Christ as our Savior, is that we have a common bond with Christ. Not because we made it special, but He did. And so as He come and we join Christ, and we accept Him, we accept the payment that He's made on our behalf, there's a heavenly calling that we share in. There's a common bond that followers of Christ have. <clears throat> this heavenly calling, our calling is an invitation to heaven. We have to each respond to. It's very interesting that if we look at, the, at the, there's something known as the four spiritual laws. Just as the, we have laws of, of, of nature, or laws that, that govern the physical part of our world. You jump off a building, gravity takes effect, you get too cold, uh, hypothermia sets in. Those are all laws of nature. Just as there's laws of nature, there's also spiritual laws that govern our relationship with God. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, why is it that a lot of people don't see that wonderful plan? Because of the second law. We are all sinful and separated from God because of our sin. We can't know and experience God's love and plan for our life. Ah, but thirdly, God knew we were in an impossible dilemma that we couldn't fix. So thirdly, Jesus Christ is God's solution to our sinfulness and our separateness from God. Now, Satan himself knows those first three. That doesn't make him a child of God. So just to know those three doesn't do us any good without the fourth one. We must individually receive Jesus as our Savior and Lord. Then we can know and experience God's love and plan for our life. <clears throat> it doesn't matter how often we attend church. It doesn't matter if we've been baptized. It doesn't matter if we read a Bible. It doesn't matter if we put anything in the offering box. It doesn't matter about any of our participation in church activities. It has to do with whether we know Jesus or not. In fact, Jesus made a statement about that once in Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> there was a lot of religious people hanging around. And Jesus was making a statement. You're either for me or against me. And he defined what that meant to be for him and against him. He makes a statement. Someday, not everyone, this is Jesus speaking, everyone will say to me, Lord, Lord. Not every one of those people will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do mighty works in your name? There's a lot of things that those people did that I, I've never done. So that put, puts them higher on the ladder, right? Jesus said, will then declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's knowing Jesus. And in fact, you know, why wait till the end of the message? Let's just do that right now. If you have never yet invited Jesus to come into your heart, I know many of you have. I don't know if everybody has or not. Or even those who are maybe are watching online. But if you have never yet truly surrendered your heart to God and invited Jesus to come into your heart, to be the forgiver of your sins and knowing that the blood that he shed paid for it all. You can do that right now. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? In fact, let's do that right now. <clears throat> Father, I know that there are some in this room, many in this room who have already done that, who have already asked Jesus in their heart to be their Savior. Lord, you know all those who have and those who have not those who are part of the household of faith, and those who are on the outside looking in. So, Father, I pray in your, in, your, in your sweetness, in your power, in your grace, that you would knock on the door of their heart. Lord, help them to, to listen to your, your call and invite Jesus to come in. Friend, <clears throat> as, your, as your head is bowed right now, and all of us have our heads bowed and our eyes closed, and this is maybe the first time or it's the umpteen millionth time you've heard this, but you have yet to either understand or accept Christ. And you'd like to do that. You can do that right now. So in the silence of your heart, let me lead you in prayer. This may or may, you, it's not the words that you say, but the, the posture of your heart before him. But let me, let me help you along through the process if you would like to know Jesus as your Savior. Dear God, I admit that I am sinful and separated from you. There is nothing I can do to make me right in your eyes. Oh, but thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, God, that he paid the price for my sins. So, Jesus, I'm asking you now to come into my heart. I'm asking Jesus that you'd forgive all my sins. I'm asking that as you live in my heart, <clears throat> you'll make me brand new. Thank you, God, for coming in. Thank you for forgiving me. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer with me today, uh, similar to the prayer that I prayed when I first accepted Jesus as my Savior, I didn't hear boom, boom, bells ringing, boom, ah, or angels singing. My heart was kind of pounding in my, my chest. I was standing up in front of a bunch of people. But it was that quiet assurance in my heart. And so you today, if you prayed that prayer with me, that's the time that Jesus came into your heart, forgave your sins, made you right to stand before God, not on your own merit, but all because of what he's done for you. <clears throat> now, when we read Matthew chapter 7, you will get to be on the side that comes in. Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew them. But there's those that he knows come on in to his kingdom. And the writer of Hebrews wants to simplify this. He said in, in, in that passage in Hebrews, Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. The word consider means to fully observe or to perceive or to discover. I want you to think about this is what he's saying. I want you to just kind of run this over in your mind. <clears throat> the first thing he calls Jesus is the apostle. And the, the, word, the, the word apostle simply means sent one. So we had, Jesus had 12 disciples, 
and he sent them out to minister to other people around the world. Well, in, by virtue of their sending, they were called apostles. But there are others that, are, that have done the work of an apostle that are sent out from where they're at to do God's work. Missionaries would be a good example of that. Jesus was sent out. Where did he come from? Heaven. To earth to take the form of a human being. But his original home was in heaven. Yet he came to minister to us. So Jesus is the apostle sent from heaven to get us to pay that, that supreme price so he could take us back with him to heaven. So he is the apostle. He is the sent one. He's also the high priest. Now in the, in the, in the, in the, the Jewish uh, religion, they had priests, but then they had the high priest, the top dog in charge. He was the one that, that, that was really the chief one. And the primary role of a, of a priest, not just a high priest, but any priest, was to represent God to man and represent man to God. So the priest would speak on behalf of God to the people. And then the priest would speak on behalf of man to God. That was the role of a high priest. Well, Jesus is our high priest. And he has come to talk to us about God and come... Now he stands in the presence of God and it says that he, he makes intercession for all of us. So he stands in God's presence and he looks at our lives and he says, God, bring them grace, bring them peace, help them walk through this. I've shed my blood for that sin. And he is our great intercessor, our advocate before the throne. And this is a common confession that all Christians have. <coughs> we all come to Christ the same way. There's only one way we can come to him. In this room and on the online, there's probably a wide range of people of different income scales, different education, different package of possessions. And then it doesn't matter about all that. We all stand shoulder to shoulder as we come before God's throne. Why? Because of the common confession, because of what Christ has done for us. We all come to Christ the same way. There's only one way, and he paid for it with his own blood. We may be different in many ways, but what we all have in common is that he has come before us in that regard. Secondly, he was also faithful in his appointment. Faithful in his appointment. In verse 2, it goes on speaking about Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him. Just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Now here is a direct comparison between Moses and Jesus. What's kind of the essence of this comparison that we're talking about here? Let's take a look. Um, the verse, this reverse refers to how Moses was faithful in his appointment. A few examples from scripture. We, if you read in, in your Bible in how Moses was appointed, he had spent 40 years in Egypt growing up as, uh, as sort of a stepchild of one of the Pharaoh's daughters. She raised him. He was educated. He knew a little bit about his Hebrew background, but not much. And then that was 40 years. And then he went over to Midian. And you don't have to read Exodus to find out how all this takes place. He was there 40 years, tending sheep. Boy, what a cultural difference that was. And then at the age of 80, God called him to be a leader as he brought him over there. He appointed him to deliver. And the first thing that he, Moses said when he got appointed by God to do this, he said, I, 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 no, I, I, I. In Hebrew, that I, I, I. It doesn't, it means the same thing. He was totally resistant. He's, the first thing he said was, they want me dead over there. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to go. I mean, because he had, he had defended one of the Jewish people over there, which resulted in the death of one of the Egyptians, and they were hunting his head. So he escaped 40 years ago, and 40 years later, they can, well, maybe they still remember me. Well, I can't remember what I ate for breakfast a couple days ago, and I'm not even 80 yet. Moses did not remember about it, but he, God says, okay, I'll take care of that. And he says, but I, 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 don't, I don't talk very good. Now, 
You read that passage in Exodus where it says that Moses didn't talk real well. He kind of had a speech kind of a thing. For the first 40 years of his life, he was raised and educated in Egypt. He was raised in public speaking. He was raised in archaeology. He was raised to be a finely tuned scholar. Give me a break, Moses. You can talk. That's not what God said. So he said, okay, you're, you're kind of resistant to things here. So you're going to throw your brother Aaron into the mix and he'll be your mouthpiece, but you're going. So there was an appointment. And so we, we read that he really was, he eventually became faithful, just as Moses also was faithful in God and all God's house. So finally, Moses got on the bandwagon here. Now there's a direct comparison. And this reading really refers to how Moses was faithful in his appointment. One of the scripture examples is in Exodus 40. He came, he came from a reluctant sheep herder, verse four, uh, Exodus 40, verse 16. Thus Moses did, according to all that the Lord had commanded him, so he did. Boy, that'd be a great thing to have carved on your tombstone. Everything is a big word. Everything that God called him to do, he did. In the book of Numbers, it's recorded, this is, I think this is kind of funny. In the book of Numbers, it's recorded that Aaron and Miriam, Moses' older siblings, had a little sibling rivalry. That probably never takes place in our church, right? Never have any sibling rivalry ever, right? Not at all. I'm not going to look anybody in the eye anymore. I probably made too much eye contact as it was. But Moses had older siblings. <clears throat> And Moses, when he escaped out of Egypt, went back to Midian, he married this, this gal, and she was of the Cushite kind of uh, genealogy, you might say. Well, Moses and Aaron were, I mean, uh, Aaron and Miriam, who were older brother and sister of Moses, started grumbling against Moses, because here's our younger brother starting to take over and lead Israel, and wait a minute, he's married to this Cushite woman. What, and they began to murmur against him. He, we should get a little bit of credit here. That probably, that sibling rivalry never happens in our homes. I'm sure it doesn't. But Aaron and Miriam were of the elite, they were of the tribe of Levi, and, and older siblings do sometimes, they began to pick on the younger brother. Let's just kind of drop in for a moment on this family feud in Numbers chapter 12. And I want to read for you just what was going on there in Numbers chapter 12. <clears throat> uh, it's going to take the first nine verses, but you've got to catch the flavor of how this is going because it really gives us an idea here. Numbers chapter 12. One through nine. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, well, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has not he spoken also through us? And the Lord heard it. He heard, he heard the family rivalry going on here. Now, the man Moses was very meek or humble, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out. Now the tent of meeting was a tabernacle. This was a holy place. And they're having an argument right there smack in the middle of the holy place about, You shouldn't do this or you can't do that. I don't, you can fill in your own words from your own family right over there. And the three of them came out, and the Lord came down on a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aram and Miriam, and they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles, and behold the form, of, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then are you not afraid to speak, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them both, and he departed. I'm not in uh, time to imply in your sibling rivalry where you say some sort of an imprecatory prayer and ask God to bring down leprosy on your older siblings. But that's kind of the stuff that was going on. But God said, with Moses, I've chosen him. I've chosen him and I will speak through him. He is the one. 
Now back to Hebrews chapter 3. Jesus is superior to Moses in holiness, uh, in, in his calling, holiness of his calling, and now his faithfulness of his calling. It says not to put Moses down, but to compare his greatness with someone even greater, there's Jesus. In verse 2, it says of Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him. In the Old Testament, the term Messiah means anointed one. Jesus was appointed and anointed. In fact, Jesus himself said in John chapter 5, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He's talking about God. And then way down in verse 36, he says, For the works that my Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I'm doing, bear witness to me. When Jesus lived his entire life, and it came to the point where he humbled himself and was put on a cross by the Romans, even though he had surrendered himself, it's very interesting. He laid down his life for you and me. And in John chapter 19, it says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, said, I thirst. And a jar of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What was finished? The payment for all, all your sins. Every thought that you've ever had. Every deed you have ever done. Every word you have ever uttered. Any of those that would have stood, stood contrary to God. Made you feel embarrassed if somebody would have seen it. Or brought shame because of God's holy presence. Every one of those are paid for by the blood of Christ. Erased from your slate. And we now stand clean because it is finished. Jesus was also superior to Moses because of the worthiness of his calling in verses 3 and 4. It says, For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has honor more than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. This isn't to undervalue Moses, but rather to present glory and honor with respect to Moses and then Jesus as a higher rank. It talks about building a house. Well, the house that Moses built, when Moses was 80, he responded to God's call. He didn't know where he was going or what he was going to do. He just remained humbly faithful. And as a result, and in retrospect, Moses was the builder of the people of Israel that God redeemed out of Egypt, that spoke the law to them. And in Exodus 14, it says, When Israel saw the great power with which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. He simply saw himself as a servant and look what God did to him. But the house that Jesus built, in fact, is still building. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Church isn't a building made out of wood and plaster. Church is a building made up of his people that have embraced Christ as their personal Savior. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but since you've accepted Christ, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the very cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are being built together into a dwelling of God by, uh, for God by His Spirit. Here, Paul's prayer for them was that they might understand who they were before God. <clears throat> there is an exercise that I went through once at a youth camp. And I'm not going to take you through the whole exercise, but I want to give you the essence of it before we close today. 
the camp, the, the camp director, we were around the campfire one night, gave every one of us five pieces of paper and a pencil. I want you to write down the five most important treasured items in your life. <coughs> Skateboard, Xbox. <coughs> write down whatever those five most important things are. And you can do this sometime on your own. Now, throughout life, there are times where we lose stuff that's treasured or valued by us. And so he would say, you're going to have, but in this case, you get to choose which of those five you will lose. So take one of those pieces of paper and wad it up and throw it into the campfire. There goes my Xbox, skateboard or whatever it was. Why? Because the other four were way more valuable to them. So we're down to four. Everything is good. And then I began to figure out where he was going. Life has its ups and downs. And now you have to give up one more. But you're fortunate enough, you get to make the choice. Which one of those remaining four goes in the fire? Oh, man. So I picked another one, wadded up that paper, and threw it in the fire. Now I'm down to three. Well, you see where I'm going. Pretty soon, when you're down to one, You've got one thing left. My, wife, my life has been stripped of everything that has given me value or pleasure, and I'm down to one. And then the camp counselor said, if what you have can be taken from you, then you've got your value in the wrong place. Tonight is the night to accept Jesus. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And if you don't have him on your list of five, you need to find a place for him on that list. He will never leave you and never forsake you. As we look at our take it home section, which is at the end of our message every time, practice. First thing we want to do is give human honor to whom it's due. There are people, there are situations, there are individuals that really deserve the honor that we can give to them, and that's appropriate, that's biblical. Secondly, though, we need to acknowledge Jesus as superior to all. Jesus is the higher rank. He rates at the top of my five, at the top of my 20, at the top of all that I have. But acknowledge Jesus as absolutely superior to all. That helps us put him in the right perspective. As we begin to ponder where we're going to be heading down the road next week, we made a couple of references, or one reference to 1 Corinthians 13, or 1 Corinthians 3. Right, jot down that passage, 1 Corinthians 3, and then this week, read 1 Corinthians 3 every day. Just let that be a part of your daily routine where you read that. And that allows us to come back and look at more of what we're going to be looking at next week. The Apostle Paul made a statement to the, his friends at, at Ephesus. And he said, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that you, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which you have been called, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great mind, so that, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. That's my prayer for you all this next week, that we would, the eyes of our heart would be enlightened so we begin to get a picture of who he really is and what he's done for us. If you prayed that prayer with me earlier, uh, if you're online, send me a note or something somehow through uh, the note system online where you're watching this, or if you're seated here, uh, tear up a little corner of your bulletin or something and Write your name and phone number on it or how I might get a hold of you. I just want to pray with you and rejoice in your newfound faith in Christ. Let's pray, shall we? 
Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that you have done everything you can do to make yourself absolutely superior to all. You are our great Savior. And to you we give our hearts. This next week, Lord, as we begin to give honor to whom honor is due, but we recognize in our heart and mind that you are superior to all. Help us to give you the rightful place that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you like to stand with us, please? Amen. Yeah.